So I looked at the, pe the brains of people while they were answering political questions or non-political questions. And I got people who were hardcore Democrats, hardcore Republicans, or people who just didn't know that much about politics, didn't care. And I asked them a set of political questions and a set of non-political questions while measuring their brain activity. And what I observed, and we got this published in, in Science a few years ago, was that there was a difference between the people who were politically sophisticated, the Democrats and the Republicans, and people who didn't know much about politics. You might look at these images and say, oh, they look really similar. In fact, they look so similar that people at, at Science, the editor, thought that it actually pasted the same image twice and made a mistake. Um, because that you can't really, you know, it's not so clear that there's a difference between the Republicans and Democrats, and they were expecting big differences there. There weren't when I asked political questions. Um, there was big patterns, however, were different between the people who were really politically knowledgeable and the people who didn't. This was really puzzling to me, and it spent, it, I spent quite a while trying to mine through the data, understand what it meant, put it in, in context with the other data that I had. What it looks like is that for pe politically involved people, thinking about national politics is like a typical social activity. The first brain imaging studies that were being done were all of what I would describe as technical cognition. Conjugate a verb in a foreign language. Imagine an object rotating in a three-dimensional space. Do a mathematical problem. Each of those deactivated this network of, of regions in the brain called the default mode network. And that technical task brain activation is exactly what the political novices are doing. They are treating politics like it's some difficult thing that they're going to be quizzed on by that, that that jerk uh, who's interviewing them on the, from the phone and calling them about their political attitudes, you know, those are hard questions. Why do I have to think about, well, you know, I've got to get the right answer. All of that technical cognition work is being done. The people, in contrast, that are very, very political, for whom that, you know, thinking about politics is like breathing. Thinking about politics is what you do for fun at the pub with a pint, right? Maybe not science, but politics, right? There's a lot of politics and sports taking place at pubs. And that social cognition, seems to be what's going on for those political sophisticates. In fact, it looks like the subject in, in school <laughs> that thinking about politics is most similar to is like recess. For political sophisticates, this is, a, this is what you do on the playground. This is what you do for fun. It's social cognition. It's, if, if you ever go to a foreign country and you hear, in particular men, I have to pick on my gender a little bit, at, the, at, a, at a bar arguing about something, it's either sports or politics, right? If you don't know the language, you often can't tell. Are they arguing about sports? Or are they arguing about politics? I would argue on a certain level, they're, it's, they're arguing about the same thing. It's coalitional dynamics. Um, who, who's an us, who's a them? Why is my team better than your team? That, 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 that value co uh, complexity and cognition that's taking place is really also about coalitional complexity and coalitional dynamics. That's why these uh, political sophisticates look in my brain imaging studies like they're a recess. For the political novices, it's definitely not recess. It's a, uh, it's, it's, there's a, a massive amount of brain activity change that looks as if they're doing something that's technically complex, technically difficult. What's really interesting is that there's no common pattern of activation amongst their brains. And in fact, in, when I look at the response latency data, I also see this pattern. There's a lot of heterogeneity. They're spending a lot of effort, but they're spending it in different ways is what the brain imaging data seems to suggest. So we're not too dumb for democracy. The human brain is the result of a three million year competition to be better at politics, the brain is massively complex precisely because the politics it enables are so difficult to manage. The complex brains, it turns out, just allow for even more complex politics. If we all raised our IQ another 50 points, right, just we found that, you know, genius water. It turns out they've been putting genius juice into the beer. Let me take another sip of it. Mmm. IQ just went up another 10 points, right? If we did that, what you would see is not that we'd all get better at politics. It would be that politics would be getting even that more complex. We don't see the solution um, by having more and more uh, educated, more and more intellectually capable people. We would see more and more complex politics. Those politics we've developed have enabled us to pursue some pretty cool things like justice, social welfare, human rights. Right? This is not a bad uh, consequence of these millions of years of evolution. There have been, I would argue, some progress with this. But political scientists have struggled about how it is exactly that we make political decisions. My mentor, John Zoller, is part of a camp of people who argue for memory-based models that, uh, that suppose that people have accurate recall, memory-based evaluations. A guy um, that I, I really admire, Milton Lodge, is promoted an argument called the online model, that people are cognitive misers, that we're using a running tally, that our old memories aren't connected to our candidate evaluations. And so this is a big debate between the people who think that it's based on memory and we're just kind of making it up as we go along um, in this other way, or we're pulling things 
on that. When I saw this literature in political science, it really reminded me of a, a set of literature that's been going on in psychology um, for quite a number of years, arguing that our brains handle complex decisions with two systems that enable us to reflex or reflect. This is similar if you're familiar with Dana Kahneman's work on thinking fast or thinking slow. It's a very similar kind of paradigm that he's drawing from. That there's this automatic system that can do things in parallel, very fast, it's very slow to learn, it's not conscious, we, we can drive, we can walk, we can do all sorts of things without really deliberating about it. But then in contrast, we have this reflective system that allows us to think step by step by step when a problem is complex. It's a little bit slower at operating, but it can learn things. Ah, yeah, I get that really quickly. And it's, a, uh, it's accessible to conscious awareness. These differences are reflected in differences in the different brain regions that are implicated. And it turns out that when I was listening to this, it reminded me of the movie Memento. So in the movie Memento, the main character there has had damage to his uh, hippocampus. And that damage to his hippocampus prevents him from forming new memories. I contended that if, if the model was right, we should be able to stick people um, that were politically, uh, uh, that we should be able to stick people who had interrogated amnesia with political candidates and show them information about them, get them to map their values to politics, and then show them those same images again when they don't remember ever having met the experimenter, having had any, any information about these candidates, and make the same judgments. And it turned out that a former uh, graduate student I worked with found exactly that. These people had no ability to form memories um, over the long term, and yet when you express that information to them again, they would make decisions as if, and they'd say, oh, yeah, that guy, I really, I, didn't, I don't like him. He doesn't look trustworthy enough. Oh, well, but this one, you know, I really think that I would, I would I'd vote for him. He's the kind of guy you could go down to the pub and have a pint with. Not remembering that the political information they'd gotten a week before was leading them to these kind of things. So the last experiment I'll talk about is an experiment we did looking at people's brains while they were gambling. So we had access to some information collected in a gambling study looking at individuals who were playing essentially a blackjack game, making a decision about whether they would double down on a, a bet or not, and um, collected for completely other purposes. But what we did, because of the laws in California, we could look up the names of these subjects. We could find out whether they were registered Republicans or Democrats. So we took that data based on public records, we looked up to see, and we wanted to see, did they gamble any differently? Could you go to Vegas and see any differences in Republicans and Democrats? And it turns out, no! You would not see any difference, no matter how hard you looked at them, checking all sorts of different ways, you could not see a difference. But what you could see is that when we looked at their brain, we could predict with 83% accuracy whether somebody was a Republican or a Democrat by the pattern of activity that they had in the brain. Now, unless you think that this is just a weird facet of American politics, it turns out a very similar study was then done in the United Kingdom. And they looked at the size of some of these same areas and discovered that the size of areas of, of English, uh, of UK youth, also differed and were able to, to identify them. A new study that uh, just came out within a, a couple months ago, they showed a single disgusting image. And one single disgusting image uh, and measuring the brain activity and the, how the person responded to that was sufficient. The brain patterns there were sufficient to allow you to identify whether somebody was conservative or liberal with a single brain image with 95% accuracy. So even in the, the year or two since I published my study, this has, we've taken a couple leaps.